everybody. I'm so glad you're here for this event uh, sponsored by Kearney Latin American Solidarity Archive. I'm Dr. Gail Presby. I am the director of CLASA. CLASA is, there's a, an archive of papers of Padre James Guadalupe Kearney, who was once a student at this university. He joined the Jesuits while he was a student at this university. I'm telling you about Father Kearney now. He became a missionary to Honduras, and in Honduras, he was very devoted to the cause of the landless and the poor. He was disappeared in Honduras in 1983. Our library has an archive of his papers, and it's in his memory that we put on peace and justice programming having to do with Latin America. And we are so happy to have this event to share with you, co-sponsored by the Jesuit community at UDM and University Ministry. We thank our co-sponsors. We thank the School of Architecture for providing this venue where we're all able to gather. And now I want to tell you something about our speaker, Father Joe Mulligan. He was also a student at our university from 1961 to 63. He joined the Jesuits uh, while he was a student here. And since 63, when he joined the novitiate, he's been a Jesuit. And of this province, but for the last 28 years, He's been living in Nicaragua, where he works with the poor and where he uh, helps students, overseas students who join the International Jesuit Volunteer Program. He's very involved in Latin America. He's on the advisory board of CLASA. He was a co-founder of the archive, so CLASA is very uh, grateful to all his uh, support for our archive. And we're so happy that we could have him speak on this issue that we're concentrating on this semester uh, having to do with the 25th anniversary of the deaths of the Uka martyrs and also their housekeeper and her daughter. He has written a book on this topic. These books are for sale. You'll see a display at the back of the room. Uh, you're encouraged if uh, you could uh, pick up a copy of this book if you're interested. And now, please, let's give a warm welcome to Father Joe Mulligan. Thank you very much, Joe. Thank you very much, Dr. Presby. Is this microphone working all right? And I have various mics here, and this is about the most techie I've <clears throat> been, I think, in my life, but I certainly appreciate it uh, for communication purposes. Thank you very much, Dr. Presby, for the nice introduction and also for inviting me to come here. And thanks to all of you for being here. I see some of my friends out there and uh, some people who I hope will be uh, new friends. Uh, you may be wondering why I'm advertising myself so prominently. Well, uh, the slideshow I will use has a lot of information in it. So rather than having to copy it all down or try to remember it all, uh, I have the slideshow on my Google Drive. So if you just send me, if you want, wish to see the slideshow with all the information, you can uh, just send me an email and I'll send you the link. That's about the best way I, th I could figure out of doing it. So, but, um, so it might help in terms of the information that I'd like to offer. And I know we don't have a lot of time, so I will dispense with my usual jokes and trying to get on the good side of an audience, you know, and just get right into, get right into the material. As Dr. Presby mentioned, uh, the 25th anniversary of the assassination of the Jesuits and the two women is coming up. November 16th. So that's one reason why there's a considerable amount of interest really in the, in the issue, especially in Jesuit universities and parishes around the country. Um, so what I'd like to present very briefly in a summary fashion is basically what happened, what are we talking about, the martyrdom, what was it, and then what does it mean to us 
This is always important because the martyrs can be great, of great inspiration and, and uh, strengthening uh, influence on us. What does it mean? A little bit about the theological and political context. This did not just happen out of the blue, just as an isolated instance. There was a whole political struggle going on, developments within the church that um, led these Jesuits and others to take a more prophetic stance uh, as critics of society and promoters of change. Then who were they? A little bit about who were the martyrs, the six Jesuit priests and the two women who were killed with them. The lady was uh, Doña Elba. She was a housekeeper in, a, in another Jesuit community and her 15-year-old daughter brutally slaughtered with uh, submachine gun fire. Uh, and then why were they killed? Why were they, why did they become martyrs? What were they doing? Or what were they saying? So we'll see if we can get through all of this and Dr. Presby is going to give me a, a high sign I think when we have 10 minutes left and we'll see where we're at and uh, have some questions. Okay. On November 16th of 1989, so almost 25 years ago, Six Jesuit priests who worked at the UCA, that's the Universidad Centroamericana, Central American University in San Salvador, the capital of the country of El Salvador, uh, were brutally murdered, uh, the six Jesuit priests at the university, along with the two women who had chosen to stay on the grounds, on the property of the university, because everybody felt that they would be safer on the grounds of the university rather than going home that night. So they stayed in a little extension of the Jesuit residence. Uh, they were killed by soldiers, Salvadoran soldiers, that is, soldiers of the, the government of El Salvador, uh, a squad of about 26 uh, special forces soldiers came onto the university and just broke open the doors of the Jesuit house and went into their room. This was at 2 a.m on November 16th, so the night of November 15th, going over to the 16th. Um, broke open the doors, pulled them out of their rooms, and made them lie face down uh, in the garden outside the house, and just slaughtered them. It was just a massacre. Uh, close, close up uh, fire uh, shots to their heads, basically. So it was a brutal, uh, brutal murder of the Jesuits and also the two women. They were machine gunned uh, in the room where they were staying. So it's, it's uh, hard to talk about that. I didn't know them well. I knew two of the Jesuits somewhat. And, um, but it, when you know somebody who suffers like that and who becomes a martyr, it's, it becomes very difficult. And yet we speak of celebrating. We speak of celebrating the martyrdom. How can we speak of celebrating? Well, it's because of their love. That's what got them in trouble. That's what got them killed. Their love of God, their <clears throat> love of Christ, their love of the gospel, their love of people, their love of the poor, especially, their love of people who were being victimized by the injustice of the society of El Salvador. And so because of their, so we celebrate their love and an active love a love that made them uh, get involved fully in the struggle for justice. You can't have love without struggle. You can't love people if you're not struggling for justice for them or for us. Um, so that's why we celebrate the memory and the love and the commitment and the courage of the martyrs. So just, I also have this slide at the end of my presentation, but what are we, what can we get out of this? Why am I going around the country giving this presentation about the martyrs? I think this can help us to grow enormously. Uh, the one lesson it would be their example of active compassion. Compassion, uh, for those of us who have studied Latin in our high school days, uh, we know it means suffering with compassion, suffering with, that is, feeling the pain of other people as if it were my own pain. And it is my own pain if we are members of the body of Christ. So compassion, suffering with, 
but not just as a sentiment, not just as a feeling in my heart, but an active kind of compassion, like the Good Samaritan, or like Jesus himself. You know, they didn't just feel compassion, love for people, but they took action and served people. And in this case, the Jesuits were involved in a, a struggle for liberation, a struggle for justice, a struggle for change in El Salvador. It's a, in their case, and in the case of Dr. King, certainly, who comes to mind as, as one of our best known American martyrs, um, it was a kind of a political love. You know, it sounds a little strange, but it, political love, that is, or at least organized love, whether you're organizing unions, or women's organizations, or neighborhood organizations, uh, consumer organizations. We just had this tremendous march in New York City, 400,000 people for the, um, talking about the climate change issue. So it's love that expresses itself in organizing, organizing ourselves, organizing other groups that are oppressed to make for change. Because you cannot love people who are suffering if you are not involved with them, not for them, or doing things for them, but if you are not involved with them in doing things, making changes for a better life for them or for us. So I would say political, that is organized love, community organizations, unions, uh, student organizations, whatever. So the famous statement by Joe Hill, the labor organizer of many years ago, don't mourn, organize. Okay. And I think that's what we can say, that's what the martyrs of El Salvador, that's what Dr. King would want us to say. Don't mourn, don't waste your time mourning the horrors of their assassination, but organize for change. You know, carry, carry forward their spirit, carry forward their commitment. That's what we need to do. And I think we can learn that from them. Their love, the martyrs of El Salvador, their love was political, organized, in the sense that they were working for change, working for social change, structural change. We talk about that a lot in Latin America, structural change. That means more than giving a piece of bread or a piece of clothing or a bottle of medicine to people who are poor. It means structural change means changing the system, changing the structures of society so that there is a better life for everyone. So they were, they were involved in that. And that was one of the main reasons that got them into trouble, because they were running our university. They were in charge of our Central American University, a Jesuit university in San Salvador. And they saw that university as an instrument for social change, an instrument for the liberation of the country, the liberation of the people of the country, by being a critical, consciousness of society, analyzing the structural problems, analyzing the, the social issues, and working for effective change. So they were making a difference, and they were feared, in a certain sense, by the oligarchy, the famous 14 families that traditionally have run El Salvador, and by the military. Th these people had influence publicly. And then finally, their courage, a prophetic Courage. You put yourself on the line uh, because you, you believe in what you're doing <clears throat> and you believe in the need uh, to struggle for change. So we can get courage from them. Also, it's also a great challenge to us. Makes us ask, well, what am I doing? What am I doing with my life? Uh, what about my work? What, what kinds of things am I involved in? Am I helping to create a better future for your own generation, for instance, and future generations? Now, I'd like to have a nice big screen here. I'm, I've never had such a big uh, screen, so I don't think there should be any problem in, in reading that. Um, what was happening in the church? What was happening theologically that led these Jesuits and other Jesuits to get involved the way they were for justice? Well, we can go back, depends on how far you want to go back. You can go back to the Second Vatican Council, 1962 to 65. You can go to the Medellin Conference in Medellin, Colombia of the Latin American bishops. They made some very strong statements about structural sin. We had never heard much about that in the church before. Structural sin. We always thought of sin as a personal or interpersonal matter. You, you harm some other individual. 
That's, that's what we mean, meant by sin. But there can be structural sin, racism, for instance, that is, is built into many of our institutions. That's a structural kind of sin. It's not just one person being a racist towards another, but it, it has to do with the structures of society or of institutions. But let's begin with the 1971 Synod of Bishops made a very remarkable statement, although I've always regretted that word constitutive there. I, I think we should say essential. So action on behalf of justice and participation in the transformation of the world fully appeared to us as a constitutive, that is uh, essential, dimension of the preaching of the gospel. Or in other words, of the church's mission for the redemption of the human race and its liberation from every oppressive situation. So talking explicitly about liberation. And this is a very authoritative statement of uh, bishops who were meeting in Rome. So uh, here they're kind of taking us beyond a uh, sort of imagined dichotomy. Sometimes there can be a dichotomy between our faith commitment to God, our faith commitment to Christ, and our work for justice. But really there is no dichotomy for a Christian because we are to love God and love our neighbor, and love God in our neighbor. So they're trying to bring those two loves, those two dimensions together. And uh, so that it's a constitutive dimension of the preaching of the gospel. And uh, I don't know if that's too clear. The, so in our own order, the Jesuit order, the Society of Jesus, we took that up and made this statement, the mission of the Society of Jesus, that is Jesuits, um, this is a Jesuit university, uh, is the service of faith of which the promotion of justice and is an absolute requirement. That's very strong and very clear. So we're getting beyond that old dichotomy, that old contradiction, imagined contradiction. Some people say, oh, you're working for love of God out of your faith. Others say they're working for justice. We say, well, it's both. And so this had effects, bore, bore fruits in the Jesuits of El Salvador and, and of course in many many other Christians. Uh, some would say um, the martyrs, a martyr is someone who dies for the faith. That's the traditional definition of martyr. Dies for the faith. Somebody who is persecuted, let's say, by non-Christians somewhere and they continue to profess their faith in Jesus Christ. So that's a martyr if they're killed. But now we see that someone who's killed because of their struggle for justice like Dr. King, like these Jesuits and other Jesuits, like the four North American women who were killed brutally in El Salvador uh, before this. They're martyrs, because if you're working for justice and you're killed because of that, then you're a martyr, because work for justice is an expression of your love of God and love of neighbor. So just leading up to this now, and getting closer to 19, uh, this is still in the 1970s, uh, a Jesuit by the name of Rutilio Grande was killed, assassinated in, uh, on a country road not too far from his parish church in El Salvador. And what was he doing? Well, he was supporting the right of the peasant farmers to organize. That's all, basically. He was very uncertain as to what position he took with regard to revolutionary movements as such. But he knew that as the pastor, he had to support, and as an official of the church, he had to support his people's right to organize. To organize for, to get a little more than uh, 100 bucks a month as a salary for farm work and that sort of thing. So he was brutally assassinated, along with two lay workers who were with him in a truck. Um, now, where is El Salvador? It's in Central America, just below Mexico, um, above um, South America. It's a very small country, very densely populated. That's one of the problems. It's so densely populated. Now, moving along in our little historical context, in 1979, we had the triumph of the Sandinista Revolution in Nicaragua. And you have to understand that there were revolutionary movements going on. This one had triumphed in, in Nicaragua in 1979. Uh, another one was going on, picked up steam really during the 80s in El Salvador and also in Guatemala. And so the Jesuits were killed in 1989 in the midst of uh, very strong conflict 
between the revolutionary forces of El Salvador, the FMLN, and the government forces. That was going on. It was a wartime situation when the Jesuits were killed. So with the triumph of the Sandinista revolution in Nicaragua and then the, the development of revolutionary uh, war, really, we're talking about revolutionary struggle, revolutionary warfare in El Salvador and Guatemala, especially. March 24th, 1980, the assassination of Archbishop Romero. He will probably become a blessed and then pretty soon a saint, we expect with Pope Francis, that the doors are open for the sainthood for Archbishop Romero. Why was he killed? Because he was speaking out against the oligarchy of his own country, the upper class, not against them in the sense that he hated them or wished evil for them, but speaking out in a critical way with regard to the injustices of his country, El Salvador, and also speaking out in a critical way against the repression of the military, by the military forces of his country. So he was murdered, he was celebrating mass and was shot in the heart by a sharpshooter at the door. Um, he was very, very well loved by the people and immediately after his assassination, the revolutionary movement started picking up more steam because they figured if, if the oligarchy, the upper classes, and the military are, are w willing to kill an archbishop of El Salvador, then this is going to be a long and hard struggle, uh, which it was. He had written a letter to President Carter um, an open letter asking the United States not to intervene in El Salvador's fate by arming brutal security forces against the popular opposition movement. This did not sit well with the government of El Salvador or the military because the military were getting tremendous amounts of training and military equipment from the United States government. He said that U.S. support would only sharpen the injustice and repression against the organizations of the people struggling to gain respect for their fundamental human rights. That was just a few weeks before he was killed. Now this opens up another area that I would put in with my what do we hope to accomplish. I think looking at this case and other cases of El Salvador can help us to develop an intelligent, uh, questioning, critical attitude toward our own government and our own government's foreign policy especially. Because just to to state it very simply, uh, the United States has been on the wrong side of the world revolution, as Dr. King put it, exactly one year before his assassination. There, are rev there were, there are not too many anymore, but in those days there were revolutions happening in various parts of the world. The U.S. was usually supporting the upper classes, the status quo, the oligarchy ruled by the few, and the military. Tremendous amounts of military assistance. So we, we can look critically at our own government. I think that's one fruit of this uh, reflection that we can uh, get. Also, the, then in, later in 1980, the assassination of the four U.S. church women, three nuns, and uh, one lay missioner, brutally assassinated uh, on their way back from the airport, again in, in El Salvador, talking about, always talking about El Salvador. So I've already mentioned this. Um, th basically, this is the event that we're talking about, the assassination of the Jesuits, the two women. Uh, the order came down actually from Colonel Rene Ponce, the head of the staff, the chief of staff of the armed forces of El Salvador. And it was not necessarily to kill all the Jesuits and anybody else who was found around there. It was to kill Ella Correa, We'll see a little bit more about him. Uh, Ea Correa and leave no witnesses. Now, they were also interested in getting rid of a couple of the other Jesuits in particular. One was the director of the Human Rights Institute of, the univer of our university. Obviously, they wanted to get rid of him. He was criticizing the violations of human rights. And um, others were, were also critical of the government uh, in many ways. Kill Ea Correa and leave no witnesses. Father Ea Correa, uh, Ignacio Ea Correa, he's in the middle there at the top. Uh, he was the president of the UCA, the president of the university. 
um, a very well-respected, renowned uh, intellectual, philosopher, theologian, one of the groups, so-called so the theo Theologians of Liberation, um, and a very influential person in El Salvador. Uh, so he was the target. Why? Because he, was, his, he and his university were, were analyzing society and using the intellectual resources of the university to analyze the injustices of Salvadoran society and promote change uh, and criticize the violations of human rights. Um, others there, I'll mention something about a couple of them. Um, the, uh, to the right of, as you're looking at that, to the right of Ignacio E. Acuria Segundo Montes was the, the director of the Institute of Human Rights. Elba was the cook at a, uh, a different Jesuit community, but she and her daughter were on campus uh, that night because, as I said, everybody thought they would be safer on campus rather than going home because the place was covered with troops. The, there were troops all around the university because the FMLN, the revolutionary forces, were putting on what they considered would maybe be the final offensive. And the military were afraid that the revolution might actually take over the capital city. So it was a state of martial law. There was a curfew at 6 p.m. And uh, so it was felt that Elba and her daughter would be safer by staying on campus but it, it turned out to be a very brutal death for them. So Ea Curia, he was a Spaniard who had spent many years in Latin America, president of the university, philosopher, theologian. He was promoting a negotiated settlement. He was not like 100% for the revolutionaries. Uh, he, he recognized the right of the people to struggle. He recognized the need for social change, the need for the people to defend themselves in, in a way, but promoting a negotiated settlement. But this did not meet with the approval of the military leaders. They did not want a negotiated settlement. They did not want to negotiate with the revolutionaries, the guerrilla, guerrilla forces. They said, no, we wiped them out. We're not going to negotiate with them. So that was his position. And he was quite influential, even some think he was, uh, had some influence with the president, President uh, Cristiani, at the time. Uh, he was, of course, motivated by the values of the gospel, um, values of Jesus. His book, Freedom Made Flesh, was published by Marinol Orbis Books in 1976. A key concept of his was, had to do with salvation history. Now, many of us who have studied scripture and theology and so forth, salvation history, that is the working of God in history. You know. But his point was that this has to include salvation in history. He, he made that point constantly. So this is the kind of theological thinking that got him into trouble. Because if you believe that God is involved in history on behalf of the poor, that God wants the kingdom to be coming in this earth, in this world, then you're involved in struggles for change. Uh, so it's salvation in history and of history. That is, salvation has to do with a better life for the masses of people, the majority of people of the world who are suffering at present. And I might just have to close with this. I can we have 10, eight minutes now? <laughs> Uh, actually, uh, I know some of you, probably most of you, will have to leave uh, right at the appointed moment. We do want to have a little bit of time for questions. But others, if you can stay, if you wish to stay, we can continue a bit longer. Uh, now this, again, this could be said to be the reason why the UCA, our university, was attacked. Not only were the six Jesuits and the two women killed, the place was shot up. The, the squad of the Atlacatl Battalion, which had been trained by the U.S., again, U.S. involvement, they had been trained, many of them had been trained at the U.S. School of the Americas, and others had been trained by a special forces, U.S. special forces team in El Salvador just before they were called out to go to the university and carry out this deed. Uh, so they shot up the university. They destroyed computers, they bombed, uh, shot rockets at various buildings. The Ea Curia, 
He wanted his university to be a critical and creative consciousness effectively at work in the service of the community. So if you're running a university like that, you're not going to be very popular with the forces of the status quo, the people who do not want any change, the people who are profiting, benefiting from the injustices in society. We could say that that could be applied to other Jesuit universities as well, because we believe that our universities, just like all of our institutions, our works uh, as Jesuits, need to be involved in the promotion of justice and the pro promotion of a, of a better world. So um, just to see a little bit of the damage that was done, they, they shot up the, the whole area. And this is basically the event that we are <clears throat> commemorating and, as I said, celebrating. Celebrating in the midst of tears, but also celebrating with hope that uh, with people like that in the world who gave their lives, like Dr. King and many others in this country and other countries, with people like that in the world, there is hope for humanity. This, this indicates Father Armando Lopez's view. If the riches of our country are declared, there will be sufficient for all. When they organize, they are killed. Well, he was killed. Um, he paid the price. And I, I will end with this one, at least for now. Uh, St. Ignatius, the founder of the Jesuits, has a statement in his little book, The Spiritual Exercises. Uh, what have I done for Christ? What am I doing for Christ? What will I do for Christ? Well, Ignacio Ecoria made a little a adaptation of that, and he put, it, he put it this way that you're seeing on the screen. For, because we believe that Christ is in the crucified, in the people, especially in the poor uh, and the imprisoned. And, uh, and so he's in the crucified, being crucified in the people. So what will I do for the crucified peoples of the world, which is where we find Christ? And he said, we must take them down from the cross. Uh, the cross is not a good thing. You know? um, the cross is an instrument of torture and uh, execution. So when we see people being victimized and being crucified in, in many different ways, we need to take them down from the cross. We need to put an end to, to that torture and that abuse of people. So um, I think I will have to close there. <laughs> Do we have a few moments for questions? Okay. Thank you so much okay. for your presentation. Yeah.